So we're gonna focus on um, the backpropagation algorithm, which is the way to update the, all the parameters in the neural network. Okay, we want to know uh, an efficient way to um, have the gradients for each parameter in a neural network model computed in a, in a uh, with a compact uh, um, equations with memorizable like uh, equation, e easy to use, easy to memorize. Okay, so uh, before we introduce the algorithms, we'll look at the uh, two things the activation functions and the derivatives, uh, especially the derivatives with respect to vectors and the matrices, okay? So first of all, activation functions. Uh, we have known about the sigmoid function. In the previous lecture, we have uh, put a lot of neurons together, which all have sigmoid activations, okay? Because the sigmoid function will output the, the, the outputs range is between zero and one, which is a perfect choice for logistic regression, right? But uh, oftentimes we find that sigmoid function is not that helpful um, because it has a um, pretty good, um, um, pretty good, uh, I would say slope around uh, zero, it's like uh, almost a, a linear line, right? Which means the, the, the gradients will change like linearly, it will change significantly. But when we approach large inputs, the slope would be much more grow, a change slower, okay? Which means the gradients will not significantly change when the outputs is too extreme, like too small or too big, okay? So that is a problem. Okay, and if we don't use sigmoid and we use a general term G to indicate the activation functions, we actually have other options. For example, the 10H function, which is in this form, which you already know when we uh, introduced the computation graph in the practice, right? So it's um, more or less the same shape as sigmoid, but the good side is that it has negative uh, values. Okay, which means the output can be negative values between negative one and one, which means it's in a, uh, in a, in a broader range, okay? But also it has the same, uh, uh, so-called the, um, the slow change problem near large value uh, input values. So uh, still the 10H, uh, works uh, always or almost always work better for hidden layers than sigmoid, right? Uh, but that, 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 is, that, doesn't, that, that doesn't mean that sigmoid is useless. For, for logistic regressions, we always need to use sigmoid as the outputs for the last layer, right? But for the, for the internal layers, for the hidden layers, we don't necessarily need to use sigmoid. Actually, we need to use something else, okay? But they all have both uh, downsides, the small gradients, okay, for extreme Z values. So we need to uh, use something called, uh, well, it's just something else. We need to use something else that has a better property when the input is large or small. So one option is to use ReLU, okay. So this ReLU means that when the input is negative, we will let the output to be zero, okay? So the output is flat on the left. But when the output is greater than zero, we will make the output an unbounded linear function, okay? It's unbounded. So when the input is very big, the output can also be very big. So these unbounded linear parts on the right actually means that um, the training can happen really fa much faster because the gradients can have arbitrarily large values, okay? The gradients are not uh, limited by the, by the limitation of these two kinds of uh, nonlinear functions, okay? So ReLU is often uh, a, a good choice. And the, if we think about the gradients 
or the derivatives of this ReLU function. We can think of it as two half. On the right, on the left, it's a constant value. So the gradients will be zero. And on the right, it's a linear function. So the gradients will be one, okay? Which also means the gradients is uh, pretty easy to compute, okay? So again- uh, yeah, really Quick question about that graph. So why not just do something like um, X equals Y, right? So where it's like just a straight line, why um, make it so that it's flat on the left and um, constantly increasing when it's greater than zero? Uh, yes, a very good question. So why not we just use a linear line? Exactly, right? yeah. Right, why not we just, so a linear line would cause problems and we will see in the later slides that if all the activations are linear functions and there's no activation function like this or like this applied, then the whole neural network will eventually collapse into a single linear function. Mm -hmm. It is mathematically no different than a single linear function. Okay, okay. because th there's non-linearity. There's, there's no non-linearity introduced uh, into the model. If there's no such a non-linearity, then the whole model will collapse. It's, it, it is essentially no different than the sim simple, linear, uh, simple linear function. Okay, so in a few slides, we will show why that is the case. Okay, so yeah, for binary classification, we still need to use sigmoid, but for the hidden layers, uh, we would use ReLU and, uh, or 10H. And uh, nowadays I think ReLU is more oftenly used, okay? And actually there are several kinds of, several variants of ReLU, okay? All kinds of different types of ReLUs that are suitable for different uh, situations. Okay, so now uh, let's get into the, uh, the question of why we need activation functions. What, why not just we put linear activations, okay? We can just uh, use, um, the Z directly as the activation, right? We don't use, we don't apply any nonlinear uh, activations. So uh, if we have this, then we can simply substitute the equations from here directly into the term here, right? So if we put this thing, right, directly into this part, we will soon find that, okay, and because we can combine the W2 and W1 together and the remaining part together, it looks to us, it's just another linear function, okay? So it doesn't bring anything, it doesn't contribute anything new, right? Why not we just use a one linear combination plus the bias instead of using these two Ws. So these W2 and W1, if they are directly connected connected together without any non-linear activation functions, it's, it, it, mathematically speaking, it's no different from a linear function, okay? So it's, um, for example, in this example, if we have a logistic regression outputs, we have sigmoid function uh, used here. And for the all the hidden layers, if we use linear activations, okay, then the whole thing together will not be any, will not be more powerful than a standalone, than a standard uh, logistic regression. All these parameters here uh, will be redundant. Okay, all these parameters here will be redundant. So we just need a one neuron to do the to do the job, but we don't need all these uh, additional neurons. Okay. So, but a, a linear activation function can be used as the outputs, right? Uh, for example, the regression model, right? When we want to produce some uh, price, produce the stock market price, the house price, we, when we, whenever we need a number, we should use linear outputs. All right, let's uh, move on. So actually now let's uh, look at a bunch of um, activation functions, okay? So, so just to for summarize, uh, we have sigmoid, 10H, ReLU, and uh, here I, uh, introduce this variant of leaky ReLU, okay? So actually 
uh, it's more popular, getting popular, getting more popular uh, recently because you see the difference. The Li Kirelu uh, is that, um, okay, I, there's a typo here. So first of all, there's a typo. There shouldn't be a Z here because when we consider the gradient, the, the derivatives with respect to Z, the Z is gone, okay? So the leaky part is here, which means there's a very slight change. There's a very slight, small uh, slope for the negative part. So that means when the input is negative, the function will not be constant. It's just a slow, changes slowly, okay? Which means the model will still be learning when the input is negative. The, the gradients will not be zero, okay? Otherwise, when the input is, if it's in pure value, then the input will be zero when, when the input, uh, the, the gradients will be zero when the input is negative, which means the model is not picking up, is not learning. So sometimes when the model is too big, we want the parameters to be, uh, to be learned or to be updated more actively. We can pick this leaky ReLU instead of ReLU, okay? And there's some more variants on the next slide. So uh, in PyTorch, I use PyTorch as uh, uh, example, but it, it, it basically applies to all frameworks uh, on the market. Uh, for example, the sigmoid, uh, in, sometimes instead of using sigmoid, people would, uh, would uh, pr prefer the logarithm of the sigmoid, which is to apply one more logarithm function on top of sigmoid. So which uh, has better, Numeric, uh, numeric stability, okay? And for 10H and uh, hard 10H, it's also a um, difference in implementation. I think uh, hard 10H is something like a, uh, something between is a hard linear function. It's not a smooth line. It's not a smooth nonlinear line, okay? It's like uh, three segments of straight lines, okay? Sometimes also useful, okay? And for ReLU, I think there are a ton of variants for ReLU. We have leaky ReLU, right? We also have this ReLU 6. So ReLU 6 basically looks like uh, we have constant here, increase here, but when a value is greater than six, it just cut off, okay? Or when it reaches the value of six, I don't remember details. Maybe it's the value here. Yeah, it, it should be the value here, six. So it has a hard limit on the output. So I think it's quite a empirical. They just use the magic number six. And I guess the, the reason is that uh, sometimes we want to avoid the gradients to be, uh, to explode. Okay, we don't want the network to be unstable by having too much, uh, by having a too, too large a gradients, okay? And those other variants like R, R ReLU or P ReLU, whatever, uh, they all use kind of different techniques to basically increase the stability of the network. All right, so that's the part for the activation functions. Okay, so now let's get into the parts uh, for computing the gradients or the gradient descent part for neural networks, okay? So uh, speaking of gradient descent, it is a method to uh, update the parameters step-by-step, step, right? We want to tune the parameters so that the output matches the ground truth as close as possible, okay? So that means we want to know the uh, partial derivatives or the gradients with respect to each var each uh, parameters. In this case, our parameters are W1, B1, W2, and B2, right? So now let's assume that the input dimension is N0, zero in the superscripts, and the number of units in the layer one is N1 and N2. So we have all these notations laid out. W1 is N1 by N0, B1 is N1 by 1, W2, WB2, right? And assume that we are considering a binary classification. So that means the outputs would be something uh, used for a logistic regression, okay? And we have already know that 
uh, we are using W1, B1, W2, B2 as the input parameters. And for each single uh, data input example, we will have a loss function, okay? So this loss function uses the Y hats and Y to compute the distance, right? It's the, in the form of Y times logarithm, uh, plus y times uh, one minus y times logarithm of one minus y hat, something like that. It's a, it's a, a little bit longer equation, right? But you know that. And uh, actually, the y hat here is just the activation from A2, right? It's just the outputs here, right? So this is actually the same thing. And we use the loss function to indicate uh, each uh, data example. Okay. So now, what we really want to know is what is the gradients of W1, which is a partial derivative of this function, the, the cost function with respect to W1, right? And for W or for B1, right? W2 and B2, these are what we want to know, okay? So how do we do that? That is something we're gonna discuss today. Now let's uh, look at, I have a brief recap of the logistic regression. The loss function looks like this. And we know that when we go back from the loss to the previous step one by one, we have the DAs available, right? DAs in this uh, form and go step, one more step, DZ. Okay, is the DA using a chain rule, DA times the partial derivative with, of A with respect to Z, okay? And it'll be A minus one. And for the W1, W2, and B2, uh, and B, we will have the formula like this. So this is something we already know for a logistic regression, right? So one thing we can write in short or write rewrite with a more compact form is that we can write, dw instead of this dw1, dw2, but we put it into a vector, right? So now dw has two components, which is basically the results of applying this dz with this x vector, okay? And the x vector is a row vector. So we put a uh, x transpose to instead of, to indicate that this is a row vector. Uh, this is a row vector, yes. So, our oh, dz would be the quantity here, a minus y, okay? So this is a more compact form. So uh, since x is a column vector, so uh, if we want to observe a row vector here, we need to transpose it, okay? Okay, so based on this, we'll look at the uh, back propagation uh, for the uh, two layer neural network, okay? So the neural network looks like this, okay? Four hidden units, one output units. All right, so, and I listed all the parameters and uh, intermediate variables here. So let's just do the same thing. <clears throat> and going from the left, from the right to the left, but this time we only uh, we have some additional superscripts to indicate the layers. All right, so DA2, which will be the same, same thing as the, as the new logistic regression, right? And for DZ2, it's just A2 minus Y, which is also the same thing. And DB2 will be DZ2. And what about DW? Okay, so this is something we want to know. So if we observe the shape of DW2, Okay, because it has four inputs. So it'll be a one by four row vector, right? It'll be one by four row vector. And if we look at the inputs from the previous step, uh, Z2, okay? So the Z2, uh, no, not, from, for, not from the previous step. So Z2 is here. So if we look at the shape of Z2, Z2 will be the dot product between this W2 and our inputs, right? A1. A1 is the input is the output from the previous layer. Okay. So actually, if we are considering the partial derivatives of Z2, 
with respect to the W2. Okay, it's actually with respect to this lowercase w vector. Okay, it's actually a one transposed. Okay, so uh, we'll come to that later. Why this is the case? Okay, because when we think about so sim simply speaking, to briefly speaking, the partial derivative of this z two with respect to this vector w two is basically the derivatives with each component of that vector, okay? We basically need to take the W1, W2, W3, and W4 out and the take the derivatives uh, respectively, which would result in a A1 vector, okay? But it will be uh, in a row, it will be in the row, uh, in the row vector shape. So we need to transpose A1 because A1 is a column vector initially here, okay? so. We will get the partial derivatives like this, and this will be used to compute the gradients. Okay, so this is not the gradients yet, right? It's just the partial derivative between z and the w, right? And we need to connect with the da's, right? We need to use the chain rules. So the result would be <clears throat> we will use the dz, uh, use the gradients of dz times the partial derivative, which is a1 transposed, okay? That'll be the gradients for dw2, okay? And we will find that the dw2 is in the same dimension as w2, okay? For that, we can already see here from here, right? The dimension of dw2 will be one by four. And if we transpose a1, it will be also be one by four. So these two dimensions actually matched, okay? So uh, that is how we compute the DW2. All right, that's our first step. So next we need to go a step further back to the previous layer, okay? So if we look at the gradients, because the, the previous variables would be this layer, this half, right? Would be the A's, okay? So the A's, Using the chain rules, we already we already know dz, right? We just use the gradients of dz, uh, dz2, the gradients times the partial derivatives between z2 and a1. Okay, so now is it is this thing that we need to consider. Okay, what is the what is the partial derivative between uh, of z2 with respect to a1? Okay, we will tell that the partial derivative is w2 transposed. Okay, and the results, the A1 is the same dimension as A1, okay? Let me clear the plot. The, uh, this partial derivative will be W2 transposed, okay? And, and then we times that with DZ2, which will give us the A1, okay? And next, the connection between dz1 and dA1 is basically a one-to-one -one mapping, right? One dz, dz1 creates a1, dz, z2 creates a2, and z3 creates a3, z4, uh, z4 creates a4. So it, there's a uh, there's a element-wise multiplication that we need to use, okay? Which is the dA1, the gradients for a times the partial derivative between A1 and Z1. And this is de uh, determined by the uh, activation function, okay? The partial derivatives is just the, uh, is just the gradients or is just the derivatives of the, of the activation function, okay? So we, we got to refer to the uh, cost function or uh, refer to the activation function we actually use for the hidden layer, okay? So, it's an element-wise uh, multiplication. So if we substitute the dA1 into this term, it will be a complete form like this. So that is dZ1. And after dZ1 is computed, we will able to compute the dW1 and the dB1 and dB1 as well, okay? So uh, the next step will be easier. It'll be just the copy of this step, right? We already know that dW would be 
dW is dz2 times a1, uh, a1 transpose. So if we follow the same principle, we are able to compute the dW1, okay? dW1 would be dz1 um, times xt trans, x transpose because to this layer, x is the inputs, okay? And dB is just the same shape as dz. All right, so you can see I, I highlighted colors here because this step, these uh, pre-steps will be used in the computation of this one. And this pre-step will be used in the computation of this one. And the, the blue parts will be, the blue parts here steps will be used in the computation of DZ, uh, DZ one. So um, on this slide, I didn't show the complete uh, whys this is the case. For example, I didn't show why uh, this is the case. I think this step takes a little bit to, to, to get connected, why we need to transfer uh, transpose A1. And also this one is also not that straightforward because why when we can, when we are considering the, uh, when we are considering the partial derivatives of Z2 with respect to these four elements would be W2 transpose, okay? So this transpose relationship may be a little bit uh, hard to connect, but we will have in the next slide to uh, uh, step into more details, okay? We will step, we'll analyze this uh, more closely, okay? So uh, we are particularly focused on the question of what it means, what it really means when we compute the derivatives with respect to a matrix, okay? So focusing on this input to the hidden layer, we want to know the um, gradients, right? We want to know the gradients with respect to DW1. Then we need to know what are the partial derivatives from this output variable with respect to this vector, with respect to this matrix, right? So this is not a straightforward uh, process, right? Because we are familiar with derivatives with respect to one variable, right? But how about matrix? And actually the concept is also, uh, uh, can, be, can be defined, okay? It's, it, it is doable. So we, we just need to follow this principle. If we want to know the derivatives with respect to a matrix or a vector, we just need to take the, we just need to compute the partial derivatives of each component of Z1 with respect to each component of W1, okay? So it's a many to many mapping relationships. It's actually a lot of combinations. So actually for each pass, we need to take the partial derivatives, okay? So that's actually a lot of competition happening here. So in this, if we extend the, the, the mathematical notations here, Z1, right, is actually a vector. It has four components and W has four times three, which is 12 um, elements. So what this sentence means that we need to take the partial derivative of Z1 with respect to W11 and with, w, with respect to W12, with respect to W13, okay? Also, this is not done yet. We need to take the derivative of the same, same Z1 with respect to the second row, right? And third row until we are done with all the elements. And that's just for Z1. And we need to do the, for Z2, we need to do the same thing. So technically that's what we need to do, okay? So in this case, we just ignore B1 for now because for B1, it's a simpler case. All right, so seems a lot of computation, <clears throat> but actually, if we take um, um, one element out, we will see that it actually, it is very friendly, okay? Not that uh, tonally. So if we take the derivatives of the whole vector Z with respect to just one element, W11, 
Okay, so it's actually a vector of four dimensional. It's the same dimension as Z, Z1, okay, uh, of Z, okay. So it's the first component with respect to W11, second component, third component, fourth component. And because we know the expressions for the first component, right? The first component, Z1, is the dot product between the first row and the X column, okay? which means that we will have a W11 in that computation. But this is not the case for the, this green row. Green row is the dot product between the second row, right? Which doesn't, which doesn't contain W11 at all, right? And the third row, the yellow row, doesn't contain W11 as, uh, either, right? And so is the last, uh, uh, blue row, right? So that means, although this expression is com uh, complex, the result is just the first components, right? With this Z1 with respect to W11, which is just one number left, which is just X1, okay? So if we look at the <clears throat> second components, uh, the second elements, uh, there will be a X2, right? Because uh, we are, if we want to compute the partial derivatives with respect to W12, it'll be just X2 left. And for, with respect to W13, it's just an X3 left. Yeah, with the, using the same principles, okay? So that will be the first row of the outputs. And if we're looking at the, uh, partial derivatives of the Z2 with respect to all elements, it'll be just a X1, X2, X3, same, same values left. And for Z3 and Z4, it'll be the same computation. It's all just a X1, X2, X3, okay? So how do we com uh, combine this into the, uh, a compact output? It'll be something like this, right? if we want to compute a derivative of a vector with respect to a matrix, it'll be like a new matrix, okay? And this new matrix is actually in the same shape as the original matrix, as the W1 matrix, okay? So this matrix is actually the same shape as W1, and we can use it to compute the gradients, okay? Because remember, the gradients of dW is the gradients of the outputs dz times the partial derivative of the outputs with respect to w1, okay? So all we need to do is to put this thing together, is to put dz1 times the partial derivatives, which is this matrix, right? Right, we, 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 we times dz1, uh, uh, dz1, dz2, dz3 into each element into the, of the partial derivative matrix. And this expression is actually dz1 times x transpose. Okay, if you think of the, uh, think of the computation. Um, yeah, so uh, dz2, if you write it, put it, write it down on your paper, I, which I didn't have on the slides, dz1 would be a column vector, right? dz1 would be a column vector, which is dz1, dz2, dz3, dz4. Right, it's a column left, a column, column vector on the left, and x transpose would be like x1, x2, x3, right, which is the this thing transposed. Okay. Um, Oh, no, not, not this thing transport. It'll be the input transport. I'm sorry. It'll be just the X, which is a row vector now, X1, X2, X3, right? So yeah, so it's actually the product between DZ and X, okay? So the results will be this expanded uh, matrix. So it's basically like the first two elements times each other and put to the elements here. It'll be the first elements. 
And the second element will be this combination, put it here, okay? So it's a kind of a, if you uh, know linear algebra, it will be kind of the, the, outer, the outer product, or it's a linear expansion. It's usually called the outer product, yeah. So that's why, okay, given the gradients of dz1, we can use the inputs x transposed to compute the gradients of the w's. Okay, so that's uh, the I think the the technical the difficulty difficult part for understanding derivatives with respect to matrix. Something you definitely should uh, uh, go through several times until you uh, understand it. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> let's uh, continue our uh, journey to the next layer because we have two layers, right? I'd like to finish this. So what about the second uh, second DW2, the second uh, parameters, second layer parameters? It's actually the same thing, right? Uh, where we'll expand, we'll expand this. We, 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 we need to compute the partial derivatives of Z2 with respect, with respect to W2 now, okay? But it's actually the same thing. So before, in, in, in the example, two slides ago, we used one output unit, right? So it'll be like A1, A1 transposed. But this time, we have two out nodes, right? We have Z, we have these two output nodes, okay? So the W2 would also be a two row vector, a two row matrix, right? It'll be something like this, right? So if we compute the partial derivatives, like what we did in the previous slide, the partial derivative between Z2 with respect to W2 would be like a bunch of A1s, right? Uh, a bunch of A's in the second row. So this is actually the results of DZ2 times A1 transposed. Okay, it's in a similar style. In the previous slides, it's DZ1 times X transpose. It's just now use this A as the input. Okay, but the rule doesn't change. It's still A1 transpose. All right, so now we can conclude that the general principle to compute the gradients of a weight matrix is that you take the outputs, the gradients of the output, dz, times the input transposed, okay? So that is a general principle for compute this dw. All right, so uh, let's go to the next. We are not, we, there's another difficulty part, a difficult part we want to solve, which is the the gradients for the DAs, okay? The gradients for the, uh, the activations, okay? How do we do that? So uh, uh, similarly, we, we want to know the derivatives with, now this time with respect to vectors, but not with respect to matrices. Because in order to, if we already know the gradients for Z2, we, in order to know the, the gradients of the A, we need to know the partial derivatives of the Z with respect to A. Okay, so it's a vector with respect to a vector now, not with respect to matrix now, okay? So let's observe first when outputs, if the output has one node, then it's just a dot product between two vectors. So it'll be easy to conclude that the partial derivatives is just this vector, right? But the transpose because Originally, it's a row vector. Now we transpose it. So we need to just transpose W2, right? But that's a special case when there's only one output node. If in more generally, if we have two output nodes here, it's actually the same computation, right? We have the Z are computed between the, are computed like this. It's the W times A1, right? Then A, we apply the same principle because the partial derivative of a vector with respect to another vector is just the partial derivatives of each component of Z2 with respect to each component of A1, okay? So we simply need to look at each components uh, respectively, okay? So the, uh, if you look at the, these components with respect to these components, Right, it's just uh, the W coefficient here that'll be the partial derivative. 
right? And the W12 for the second component and so on. So we can have this quite quickly uh, extracted. And if we look at the shape of the partial derivative, it's just W2 itself, right? It's just W2 itself. It doesn't change the shape at all, right? So now uh, having this uh, available, and we would know that the partial derivatives with uh, respect to the first A1 is associated with the column, first column. So we are able to derive that the DA1 would be W2 transposed times the gradients of DZ, okay? So we can easily conclude that this is the general, this is the uh, case, which is the same as this form, okay? So no matter when the output is one node or two nodes, we would have the same Form the same formula used to compute the gradients for DA1. Okay, and uh, we can uh, conclude some general patterns, general principles in uh, the backward propagation is that when we want to compute the gradients of the Ws, the weight parameter, the weight matrices, we should use the gradients of the output times the input transposed. And if it's for, and for dB, it's easier. The dB is just the, the value for the output, for the gradients of the output. And for dA, the gradients with, with respect to the previous activation is the weight transposed times the dz of the outputs or times the gradients of the outputs, okay? So, and the dz from dA, it'll be just uh, easier. It's, a, it's, it's just a, the, uh, this additional step, right? It's just the element-wise uh, multiplication with uh, with the activation gradient with, with the derivative of the activation functions. Okay. So now something you can do is to check the dimensionalities. So because the W uh, the gradients of W should be the same dimension as the original value of W, right? So if you look at the results of dz times a1 transpose, the one will be gone, right? And if you look at the dimensions for a, it'll be w transpose, which makes the nl plus one here also eliminated with the nl plus one here eliminated. So actually this is a correct computation in terms of dimensionality, okay? So whenever you don't remember how the formulas you can use the dimensionalities to uh, to to reinfer to like to infer the the equations. Okay, so that is uh, uh, where I will stop here. Uh, it is the back prog back propagation algorithms for a um, neural network, okay, a simple neural network. And I would recommend you to go through these slides yourself several times on the paper until you have uh, the transpose connections uh, figured out. And uh, on the next lecture, we will further go through the next parts for the backward propagation. And we can probably also use the same example in PyTorch to show some more uh, intuitive uh, or direct uh, demos, okay? All right, and I would like to stop the video now.